So welcome guys. Today we shoot the second last episode of Behind the Bar, and that's why we are recording this uh, video to show you that uh, when we shoot these interviews, if you just pan the camera, we are three of us who are there in the shoot. This is Prasenjit, the sound specialist. Arjev cannot come in front, and I am there, and there is Parth who helps us out. So the intention of putting this video out is that today, firstly, we are interviewing Mr. K K Venu Gopal, and also that this is the second last episode of our show. So please, if you like the content and if you watch it, watch it and share it with how many ever people possible. Hello sir welcome to behind the bar okay. and thank you so much for being a part of this show right, right. it's an honor and a privilege and i'm not saying this for the camera hmm. and uh, first of all sir happy new year there could not have been a better way for us to start this year. Okay. so thank you so sir my first question to you is that how did you bring in the new years this how time did I? bring in the new years what did you do on the new <laughs> years see i have six grandchildren okay all of them are abroad okay studying and one is working no two of them are working all of them came back here for same spending uh, both christmas and new year and therefore uh, including my son from the united states one son is here daughter from the united states for the entire family was here and we had a very good time together okay sir mm -hmm. lovely to know so, so you like spending time with your family yes right? naturally okay naturally And sir, one thing I wanted to ask you is that when I see this painting behind you, you have a deep fascination towards art. So can you please tell us something about that? See, I have been collecting uh, not only uh, paintings but various pieces of art which is here around. Yes, sir. All over for the last about thirty years. Okay, sir. And you will find inside the house when you came in here, also paintings on the walls. This I bought from Yangon. Uh, Uh, from uh, Burma. Okay, sir. Uh, and uh, he's a famous uh, uh, Burmese painter, and uh, he exhibits in New York, also in uh, uh, London, and uh, he has got a beautiful studio, where he exhibits not only his paintings, but allows other artists in uh, uh, Myanmar to come to his studio. put up their paintings and without charging any fee okay and people who come to see his paintings and he is a master they buy the other paintings which he allows other artists because he is not afraid of the competition okay sir he is so much about them how did you develop your fascination towards art i don't know i have been collecting uh, not only paintings but pieces of art and uh, also books and uh, i have about 1000 uh, books which i put up on the internet okay published in 1634 that is over 300 years back onwards on every conceivable uh, subject and uh, including the life of the british uh, 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 persons who were here in india and so on on sati with pictures of sati and so on description of sati and various other uh, very interesting uh, books i put it on the internet and uh, i find i get a record of the number of persons who have uh, uh, access to the library and uh, all these books are published between 1600 and uh, 1900 okay sir and people after that it would be violating copyright therefore i could not put those on the internet 
One thing I wanted to ask you is that you're also very fascinated by animals. I believe like you have aquarium, you also have liver, <laughs> who's your dog. So can you tell us something about your fascination? Uh, this is a husky. Okay. Uh, which is uh, which is guarding me. Uh, okay. Because <laughs> against, against clients. <laughs> so how did you develop your love towards? Uh, no, I loved dogs from the very beginning. Okay. I'd been having golden retrievers okay. one after the other for the last 50 years. And the lifespan is only about 14, 15 years. Right, sir. I have a little one there, uh, uh, which is a Maltese, which is uh, 16 years old. Okay. And uh, I don't know whether it's correct, but they say you multiply the age of a dog with seven. Right. And that equals uh, human the human uh, age. And that little one must be at least uh, 115 years old. That's mm. great, sir. And uh, but because it is small, it has a longer life. This will uh, live for uh, 14 years. Okay, okay, sir. And uh, sir, so I would like to start by the very beginning that uh, do you believe in destiny or fate? Because uh, we all have heard that uh, you were pursuing physics and uh, at that time you had to uh, opt for law. So if you uh, can tell I us something. I don't believe in uh, destiny or fate. Okay. But I believe in luck. Okay. And I think I have been lucky in uh, getting into the profession, which I like. Because I started uh, uh, taking to science the BSc in the Madras Christian College. But uh, I failed because my health was not good. Okay, sir. And I had to sit at home and I was not able to do the public exam. And at that time, my father saw an advertisement. He had become famous after the A.K. Gopalan case, right. which, which was the very first constitutional case, which was done in uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court in the Patiala House. And therefore, the advertisement said, intermediate LLB of two years. For no three years of, uh, uh, or two years of BA, and therefore you could directly do your LLB. And within two years, you could uh, enroll. And therefore, I went there, opted for that and to Raja Lakama Gowda Law College and then and, and graduated. So that uh, at that time I could uh, enroll in the Mysore High Court straight away. Had to wait for uh, one year to enroll in the Madras High Court. And therefore my, I became a lawyer on the 25th of January, no 26th of January 1954. Okay. 54. That means about, I think, uh, 69 years of practice. Yes, sir. And sir, in hindsight, have you ever thought that if you would not have fallen sick and you would have passed the exam, then what would have happened? Oh, if I had uh, done science, hmm, I think uh, it's a, I would say that joining law is fortunate. Right, sir. And uh, if I had uh, continued in science, it would have been the misfortune of science. <laughs> no, no, sir, we don't think so. <laughs> but, sir, uh, there are a set of questions which I had uh, as uh, you're also young, sir, but we're a little more young. Only 91 years old. Yes. <laughs> so, uh. so, we had a set of questions which we wanted to ask you. Hmm. Like, sir, suppose I have a passion towards filmmaking and that's my profession. So, for the longer run, what do you think is more important? My passion and integrity for the subject or for me to have a discipline and routine about it? I think uh, integrity okay, sir. is the single most important uh, factor in anyone's life. Not merely so far as lawyers are concerned. But lawyers more than anybody, any other profession, will have to ensure that they, make, that they maintain the very highest standards of integrity and rectitude which sometimes you will find is lacking in a few, a very few, among the fraternity of lawyers. Therefore, uh, that I think is most important. To succeed in life, the short-term gains which you get out of either misrepresenting to the court, not being fair and uh, uh, in your representation of a case, in the long run, 
It's against your own interests. The judges will appreciate it if you are straightforward in your dealing with them. But if unfortunately you try to misrepresent and uh, you are not frank and uh, forthcoming, then they very soon know that. After that, they will treat you very, not very, very well, and it's very much against your interest to do so. Either uh, to make uh, for uh, make statements which are not true in uh, citing a judgment, where you skip that portion against you, and so on. All that the judges will find out very shortly. And so, in like we speak about integrity in the profession, you've practicing since 1954. So, when you see the contemporary lawyers, how do you think that are we headed in the right direction? Or no, uh, you see now uh, when I graduated in my law college, there weren't the advanced method of teaching which they have today. There were only lectures by part-time law lawyers or by full-time uh, lecturers and that's all. But today the national law schools and other law colleges, which are very good, the national law schools, universities, they have moot courts where you practice argument, arguing cases long before you go to court. Then uh, you have uh, seminars, you have the internet, every student is equipped with a laptop, Therefore, he sits in the lawn because you have got Wi-Fi throughout the campus and then you access your uh, uh, case law, articles and so on. And uh, then there are uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, law b b like Lexis or uh, what is the other one? Uh, Best law and so on. Mm. Okay, sir. Therefore, that was not available to us. Right. You know what we had? We had what is known as dukis. Okay. <laughs> that is little condensed books. books. Therefore, a very book of uh, 400 pages of Samand and jurisprudence is reduced to 20 pages, uh, 60 pages. And you read that and uh, you get through the exam. Okay, sir. And sir, uh, like we spoke about the excess of technology uh, which we have today. So my one question was, sir, uh, like before when you used to practice and in the earlier times, there were a lot of uh, mentors or gurus which people used to take up in the profession. And today, sir, when we see that a lot of people do practice with a senior for some time, then they switch to independent practices. So, sir, my concern was that do you think that the role or the importance of a mentor has gone today? See, previously there were a large number of uh, graduates whose background was rural and perhaps they didn't have uh, so much of control over the English language when they come to the High Courts and uh, to the Supreme Court. And so far as they are concerned, they could come up in the profession only if they had a mentor, a father, an uncle or uh, a senior uh, who is known to the family. Then alone they would be able to uh, be brought into the profession and uh, they would be trained. They would be given cases to study. Therefore, the good old days, I found from my experience in the Madras High Court, where I practiced for 25 years before coming to the Supreme Court, I found that very old juniors would walk behind the senior. After putting in 20, 25 years of practice, they were not permitted to argue a case and all that they were permitted to do was to ask for uh, adjournments on behalf of the senior. That was the situation. Okay, sir. But today I find with the national law universities and excellent uh, other law colleges, because of this moot court, then internship, that is during their uh, course in the uh, b b course of study, they have to spend a month in the, with uh, senior uh, lawyers from any part of the country learning, uh, attending courts and watching what is happening, learning as to how the case has to be handled all before they graduate. All this results in their being fully competent 
to address the court. And I was extremely happy to find young boy, boy lawyers who have just graduated with one or two years of experience, both men and women, addressing the court with confidence because the training is totally different. Mm -hmm. One from what I had when I was, and uh, you should remember I was, uh, I graduated in 1953. Right, sir. And 53 is a long time back. Right. Therefore, it's a matter of evolution of the law, co right. law colleges and the courses. Who has been your mentor, sir? I'm very curious. My mentor you. has been my father. Okay, sir. M.K. Nambiar. He argued the first big constitutional case in the Supreme Court of India. That is A.K. Gopalan versus the state of Madras or the province of Madras as it was then known. And uh, with that case, he became famous. And he had a tremendous uh, practice, uh, especially of constitutional cases. Therefore, I worked under him in the very beginning. And uh, therefore, he would allot cases to me, and I would work it up and instruct him, and then get my own cases. Therefore, it's purely on account of his uh, guidance okay, sir. that I got into the profession in the manner in where I was able to do many cases. And so, if you could, if you would want to share with us the learnings which you have got under his guidance, if there is something you would like to share. You see, basically, you have to uh, work up cases yourself. You have to do quite a lot of reading. You have to read the textbooks. And I used to read, uh, say, some uh, books like Salman and Jurisprudence, books on limitation textbooks, make notes, whether I had a case or not. This is what he was doing. He had gone to England in 19... I was born about three months after he went to England. Okay, sir. In regard to his family case. And there, uh, after he succeeded in that case, instructing uh, Queen's Council, he stayed back to do his bar and also his master's yeah, in uh, constitutional law in the London School of Economics. And there I found that he had reduced the big textbooks on which he had to write exams into about 30 pages of notes. So that when you had to go for the exam, you had to only read those notes. Now therefore, so far as he is concerned, he would ensure that I sat with him when he argued cases and then uh, he would uh, uh, so that I would learn advocacy and the skills and he was never uh, loud in his presentation some of the lawyers today they wave their hands and they, uh, they raise their voice he was always even tempered and uh, never aggressive but he was very persuasive for I learnt all the skills from him okay sir Therefore, I, I never, I would consciously not raise my voice when addressing judges. The judge would be against you. The judge would ask a question which uh, uh, was a difficult question to answer. Therefore, uh, the, you reacted in the correct manner and you wouldn't raise your voice and uh, try to be aggressive. That's what I learned from him. That is to persuade the uh, to be very calm at all in your presentation. Okay, sir. And so you started your practice in 1954 and then you shifted to Delhi in the 60s. So, sir, uh, if you can share some interesting anecdote about your early... You see, the, I was an expert in motor vehicles law. Okay. The clients were able to afford sending a lawyer from Madras to argue in the Supreme Court. And therefore, from the 60s, I was coming regularly to the Supreme Court every month to argue one case or not, some constitutional cases, some company cases and so on. My cases are reported from 64. Therefore, uh, the judges knew me and uh, they designated me, though I was practicing the Madras High Court, in 1972, March, as a senior advocate. And uh, I, but I permanently settled down in Delhi only after 25 years of practicing in the Madras High Court. In uh, 1979, 
when the Janata government came into power and I handled cases against uh, Srimati Indira Gandhi in Calcutta High Court and so on. Therefore, uh, uh, coming as uh, additional solicitor general to Delhi in 1979, everything was laid out. You, at that time, to get a telephone was difficult. Right. But the day I landed here, the telephone was installed. I was given uh, a house in Sabdajang Lane, around the so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, had secretaries and so on. Therefore, uh, it was easy for me to uh, transpose myself from uh, Madras High Court to uh, appearing in the Supreme Court of India. And therefore, uh, being an, and being an additional solicitor general, I had to go to the High Courts for appearing for the uh, Government of India. And uh, that resulted in the judges in the High Courts knowing me long before. Uh, when they came to the Supreme Court, I, I would already have appeared against some of them. Okay, sir. All this was of great advantage. Okay, sir. And then, of course, I continued my private practice in 1980, February, when uh, my resignation, when the Janata government had fallen and my resignation was accepted. Hmm? Okay, sir. So, did changing of a city also change you as a person? No, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. Then we had to work much harder. Okay. I had to work much harder uh, in handling cases for the government when uh, I was an additional solicitor general. And after that, of course, uh, there were important cases which I handled in the Supreme Court of okay, India. Sir. No, sir, I meant like personally, like suppose if you're like I'm in Bombay, so there are certain characteristics of the city which also become a part of my personality. So was there any transition in that? No, uh, in, uh, I, I, no I fully understand what you are saying right, because the type of uh, presentation which you make in the Supreme Court is different from the High Courts. Okay, sir. And here I find if you are many of the lawyers who are very, very successful are uh, more than persuasive because they put over their cases very strongly while uh, the lawyers coming from uh, the states are not able to have that amount of, I won't say aggressiveness, but the putting a trying to put over a case to press it home and then see whether the judge will uh, accept it. That, that sort of presentation uh, is different from what we find in the high courts. Okay, sir. And sir, uh, you were the additional solicitor general of India before and uh, recently you were also the attorney general of India. So, what do you think, how has the way of the functioning of the government changed in these past years? As You see, in my case as attorney general, I had, uh, I was given full freedom. The government never interfered with me and uh, they would follow my advice in all matters. I don't think uh, they disagreed with me at any time. Therefore, uh, I was able to function independently. Okay, sir. And that was very necessary because an Attorney General may have to concede certain things, but the government may not have been prepared to do so. But you have to be uh, very independent. And when you are the Attorney General, you have to have show if they s say that we want such and such a thing and instruct you in a particular manner, then you have to follow it. You can't say, no, I will not do that. I have to do that. But otherwise, in all other cases, you would act even what the government may not, you would know that the government may not, may not want it. But you think what is right is uh, a particular uh, approach. You have to do that. Okay. You have to take that approach. Okay. And sir, uh, you have seen this nation since the last nine decades. You have seen it pre-independence, post-independence, even the emergency and the riots. So sir, uh, do you think that we are headed in the right direction? And what does the future look like to you? See, I have no doubt 
that so far as India is concerned, it is now acknowledged as a power to be reckoned with, so far as well, international relations are concerned. And we have the best of relations with uh, all, the, all the countries, except two of our neighbors. And therefore, so far as uh, the difference is that we are now acknowledged throughout the world as a power to be reckoned with and our views are very important. So, for example, take the, uh, uh, the Ukraine uh, conflict and we are asked to, India is asked to uh, mediate and uh, sometimes and uh, therefore that shows the confidence that the international community has in India. Right, sir. And sir, uh, also you were, I think, the first and the only Indian who was the part of the oldest organization of lawyers, which is the International Union of uh, Advocates. Mm, that's a Union uh, International de Zavaka. Yes, sir. That's so, a Paris-based organization. Right. And uh, uh, I had to, as I was elected as president, it's mostly francophone. Okay. With a large majority of uh, French lawyers. But otherwise, from 170 countries, we have lawyers. And uh, I was again uh, fortunate, lucky, that uh, they considered me for the presidentship. And for one year, I had to live there okay. in pa Paris, except that I would fly back to do a, one case in the Supreme Court and then fly back within two, three days. Otherwise, the work involved was. Uh, quite intense and you had to go to different countries for the purpose of uh, showing our solidarity by attending their annual uh, uh, professional day for lawyers and so on. Therefore, that was a real exposure. So, did you also have to learn French? <laughs> yeah, I, had, I learned quite a few lines of fr French. Okay. There was a French uh, lady who used to come and sit opposite, I used to record the first few welcomes and when I was uh, appointed as, uh, elected as uh, uh, the president, I had to give a welcome speech when I was installed as president. The first few sentences were in French and thereafter I said I would continue in English and uh, many of the people there thought I was very fluent in French. Okay, sir. <laughs> but my French is absolutely <laughs> nil today. Okay, sir. And sir, uh, it did also benefit the Indian legal system in a big way. Uh, so I think so because we had uh, a seminars here where about over uh, 100 uh, 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 French and uh, other uh, foreign lawyers would come. Then we had a uh, uh, Congress in 1992, I think. and. Uh, there uh, about 500 uh, foreign lawyers had come and therefore uh, India was catapulted into the uh, uh, international uh, legal community okay, sir. and they recognized India and its lawyers. Okay, sir. And sir, uh, you were also instrumental in the drafting of the Bhutan constitution. Ah, that's right. So, so, what are its new and distinctive features? You see, the main thing, the Chief Justice of Bhutan, the then Chief Justice, was the chairman of the presiding this. He used to come here with two of the other members, who were also judges of the Supreme Court of Bhutan, and sit with me in my Goa house or here in Delhi. And uh, that continued for quite some time. And class by class by class, we would go into it. And I think the most important thing which India should uh, perhaps uh, think of, is the electoral system. Okay. Now, the part, political parties had to register themselves. Okay. Their, their prelim, preliminary election would be held among all the political parties. The political party which came first would be then uh, recognized and the political party came second in number would be the two political parties which alone could thereafter uh, be, be, the, be part of the government. 
the one which came first would form the government with the cabinet and ministers. The one which came second would be in the opposition. And therefore they reduced it effectively to a two-party system, though they gave every political party an opportunity. Okay. And that I think was the single most important. Uh, while here you have seen what is happening. Right, sir. With the multifarious over uh, I think 200, 300 political parties, the problems which arise in forming the government. This should reduce itself to what we have in countries like uh, uh, England and uh, US. Though there would be a third party which would balance okay. the result of the elections. So, uh, so when you were the Attorney General, you were also uh, appearing in cases when you were representing the government. Yes. My question is, sir, that sometimes your personal view on the case might be different from the viewpoint of the government. So, in such a situation, how do you reconcile yourself? You see, uh, I can't have a personal view except what would be just and correct right. in law. And therefore, if the government instructed me that this should be the uh, stand that they would take in a matter which is political or uh, uh, which sensitive, then I have to carry out whatever they want. But suppose, so far as uh, this is concerned, the general elections, the instructions from, say, a secretary level, is that this is uh, what we think is a correct position. It's left to me to decide. Okay, sir. And uh, I would go against whatever uh, is wanted if I think this is what is uh, correct, just and appropriate. Okay, sir. So, you've often said that we have taken the system from the English, but the system over there has changed significantly. So, do you think the standards of bar and bench in India need to improve? You see, the main thing is uh, legal education. Okay. Now, uh, my son is in Cambridge. Now, he works practically 18 hours a day. And he, when he comes here for a holiday for three weeks, every day he spends writing a paper. Every day. Now, this sort of intense uh, uh, coaching, I mean, nutrition, is not there. And they are not confined to a particular uh, legal subject. They cover a vast area, perhaps as to what is the Chinese uh, uh, legal uh, approach in particular cases, what is the approach in Canada, and so on. Therefore, so far as their uh, uh, training is concerned in the law, the law course, it's wide and intense. And therefore, when they come out, they have a tremendous advantage over a lawyer who passes out from an Indian uh, court because they are not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the requirements of study are not as great. And for uh, passing in a, a bigger law, to become a law graduate in the United States, I think it's a four year course. Okay. I think some of them. Uh, drop out midway because they say that it's uh, too difficult for us. That sort of thing doesn't happen here. And sir, uh, you have appeared in so many cases. Is there one case which has always been close to your heart which you which you might think is this is the case, my landmark case. Is there some case which stays with you? Mandal Commission, the cases in the emergency where uh, Karnanidhi's uh, uh, government was dismissed very unfairly, though the election, general elections were to be held within two months thereafter, they dismissed it so that he could not contest the elections. And uh, the, uh, uh, the governor uh, took over the range of government. Otherwise, you have seen that in the southern states, the BJP will find it very difficult except Karnataka today. So far as Tamil Nadu is concerned, they could never hope to govern Karnataka. Uh, Tamil Nadu, but by dismissing the Karnanidhi government on the allegation that he had uh, uh, taken a bribe in the weed deal cases, the governor took over the government and therefore the central government administered the entire state and then held general elections, but he came back. Therefore, so far as this is concerned, uh, I think 
that was the case I brought it up to the Supreme Court the prosecution against him and that's a constitutional bench judgment which is cited frequently okay sir and sir is there any message you would like to give to the future generation of lawyers you see I think you have to sweat it out and don't restrict yourself to what is taught in the, the law course you have to do wide general reading now uh, I download from uh, my office download from the uh, internet even today all these are articles which are written in various uh, uh, this uh, law journals abroad and therefore I mark to my librarian the judgment the the articles which I want to be downloaded. Distributive justice, poverty and economic development. And this is Penn State International Law Review. Judicial Review of Constitutional Amendments. This is all by foreign writers. I mean Indian writers are good, but I want to know what uh, the foreign uh, writers say about. Wake Forest Law Review. A Theory of Judicial Power and Judicial Review. David S. Law. Georgetown Law Journal, like that it goes on. Therefore, I download all this and you will find those volumes there. Right. Those are uh, uh, Judicial Review, Judiciary, judiciary separation. separation of Powers, Judicial Appointments, Judicial Activism and so on. Therefore, if I want to argue a case, I would also look into those articles and find excellent material. Because when uh, anybody writes a legal article he researches from the very beginning and therefore you get a wealth of information and therefore this is uh, what they have to do not to stick to what they are taught in the law course but they have also to go on internet and uh, get a wider uh, view of uh, law and uh, its uh, So do you think principles. practice today has become a little commercial minded? I don't know, all of us lawyers we charge a very heavy fees <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, if that is what is meant by commercial minded. Okay. No, no, because I had interviewed Soli sir before, so yeah. he mentioned that the young, youngsters today come into the field thinking of the commerce involved, so that's why I no, asked. No, you see, him, they spent a lot of money in going through the law course. Previously, this was uh, an elitist profession. And you would find that uh, people who wanted to have a profession would try to get into the medical colleges, failing which an engineering college, and as a last resort, a law college. And uh, you will find only half the number of seats in a law college was uh, filled up because it, there was no demand. But today you will find that they prefer the law course to medicine and uh, engineering, engineering uh, mostly for the simple reason that they believe that they will be able to have a great future and future would include also the uh, wealth in involved. Now they spend a lot of money, sometimes the family borrows and people from rural areas are now competing equally with those from urban areas because of the law courses which they undergo. Therefore, so far as this is concerned, uh, I would think that they have a need to make up some money for the purpose, whatever their families have spent. After that, it depends upon uh, their capacity and the hard work that they put in. And there is nothing like sweating it out. And if you don't do that, you can't come up in the profession. Right, so. so my last question to you is that, what is the secret of your fitness, sir. Of? I've, of your fitness. I've fitness. Yes, I've researched. <laughs> I have done my research that, sir, you are you do you are into physical fitness and also that when you go out on parties, yeah. you ensure to eat uh, food at home. So please, <laughs> please sh share some light on that. See, I was doing yoga from the very beginning. Okay. That is when I was very young, about 25 years old, and uh, thereafter I took to horse riding. For about 15, 20 years, I was riding horses. 
I have even ridden in uh, what is called Gymkhana races, okay. in two Gymkhana races, which is competitive riding where betting is also uh, taken. D but after coming to Delhi, I could not, I tried to ride in uh, the, uh, the, not the President's Bodyguard, but the Army Riding Polo Club. I did it, but it was too difficult. It took half an hour to go, half an hour to come, 45 minutes to ride, and that sort of time was not available to a lawyer. Therefore, I gave it up. Therefore, now it's only a question of having a trainer and having uh, and walking. And at 91, walking is a little difficult. Therefore, uh, I try my best to keep myself fit. Mm -hmm. No, sir, thank you. And uh, this has been a, a wonderful opportunity for us. And there is a lot of positive energy that we are taking in. So. Thank you so much for giving your okay. time. And I hope so you had a good show, okay. uh, good time on the no, show. No, I think so, I think so. Okay, thank okay. you so much, sir. Now let me ask you a question, how did you not take to law when sir, your father was a lawyer? <laughs> sir, I did not take to law because uh, it did not come to me naturally. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know, I sh it should have, but uh, filmmaking did come to me naturally. <laughs> and I thought that what comes to me naturally is something I should follow. Yeah. So that's why, sir. <laughs> <laughs>